بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. So one thing that you said that shocked me is that in the in Beyond Bilal is that you said that Ali ibn Abi Talib and Omar ibn Khattab may have been black? Yeah, in terms of, you know, now there's this whole thing of racialization where when people think of black, they don't think of the actual skin complexion, but they think of a specific demographic of people in a specific area. So when you say black, I'm not saying they were African-American. I'm not saying they were West African. But I'm saying if you were to take them and place them in modern day society in places where black people are, they would be racialized as being black because of their skin complexion and because of their physical features. So when we hear about the historical narrative of uh, Bilal al-Habashi, who came from Ethiopia, he was half Arab, half Ethiopian, and he was known as the, an African, he was known as a black person. Historically, even the whole title Beyond Bilal is around the fact that Bilal is usually the token black guy when it comes to speaking about Islamic history. Bilal and Sayyidina Ali were both described as having the exact same skin complexion which was Adam, Shadid al Utma, they were very, very dark skin. So if you look at me, they would have been darker than me, both of them, Ali and Sayyidina uh, uh, Bilal. And so that shows you that historically, when we look back at these figures, the way that we racialize people today, if we apply those same standards to the historical figures, many of the people who we look at historically as being, you know, non-black would have been racialized today as black. And so when we have this anti-blackness and when we have racism and when we have colorism and we have all of these things, it's important for us to look back at the people who are the most revered people in our tradition and realize that if you have those internal biases against dark-skinned people or against black people, then that means if you were alive at the time of these great people or if these great people were alive in our time, you would treat them in the same way and you'll have the same biases towards them. That was something that I wanted to, to, to highlight to show how important it is for us to remove these things from our hearts as Muslims and just as human beings in general um, because all of these people that we supposedly revere and we supposedly love and respect were people who, if we applied the same standards and the same way in which we look at black people upon them, we would look at them in the same way. So was that... Uh, Remind me if I'm mistaken. I always get this wrong. Was Ali ibn Abi Talib uh, from the family of the Prophet, peace be upon him? He was from the family of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa So his father, Abu Talib, and the Prophet's father, Abdullah, had the same father, Abdul Muttalib. So how could, from his mother probably? Get, no, uh, even from his father. <laughs> because there's a scholar called Al-Jahiz, mm -hmm. who... Um, he was a Afro-Arab scholar from the uh, Abbasid period, and he wrote a book called Fakhr al-Sudan al-Baydan. So it was essentially the pride of black people over white people because he was sick of being the victim of racist abuse. And so he decided to write a book that was kind of flipping the script. And in that book, he actually spoke about the fact that, you know, the original Arabs, they weren't the same color as the Arabs we know today. Because people that we classify as Arab today, most of them are not really Arab. They're people who have become Arabized over time. So if you look at people in Sham, if you look at people like Syrians, Lebanese, Jordanians, Palestinians, etc., these are people who historically, they were Phoenician and they were Roman. And then when the Arab rule came, they learned Arabic, they intermarried with Arabs, and so they became Arab. And they called themselves Arab. But if you look at them genetically, they have more Phoenician blood and Roman blood than Arab blood. If you go to Egypt, people who today classify themselves as Arab in Egypt, if you look historically, a lot of them have Coptic blood, a lot of them have Greek blood and Roman blood, a lot of them have Turkish blood from the Ottomans, and they have become Arabized. So even the last king of Egypt, if you look at like Muhammad Ali Basha and King Farouk, they were Albanian originally. It was an Albanian general under the Turkish Ottomans that came to Egypt. They learned Arabic, they intermarried with Arabs, and then they called themselves Arabs, but originally they're European. So Jahiz points out that he says the family of the Prophet, Sallam, the sons of Abu Talib, were all described as being dark skinned. They were described as being either Aswad, black, or, or um, Adam, very, very dark skinned. And something that historically points to the fact is the fact that the Prophet had an aunt called Um Hakim, 
Her nickname was Albeida, the white one. Why would you need to call one child Albeida, the white one, amongst all of the children of Abu Talib? That shows that the majority of them then weren't white. Or the majority yeah. of them then were probably dark, which is why they called her uh, Albeida. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, man, because they were literally in the desert under the heat all the time. How are you going to stay white when you're exactly. in the We're desert under the sun? I even, because, I, you know, I'm Egyptian, but I don't know what my Ancestry.com results would be. But even when I go into the in, into the summer, I come out of it, people think I'm mixed. And when I tell them, no, I'm not mixed, there's like, they're, you're like messing with us because it's so definitive in their mind in America. Like, oh, you're that dark. You're, you're half black. There's yeah. No way around. Speaking of that, the, the knowledge stored and the, the level of knowledge stored and taught at San Cori University. That was fascinating when you were talking about that in the book. Yeah. So San Cori University was interesting. It was a conglomerate of three different masajid in Mali, the San Cori Mosque and the Sidi Yahya Mosque. Um, and another mosque, and they had classes in between these three masajid, and they ended up building a library of over 700,000 manuscripts, which is the largest library in the history of Africa since the Library of Alexandria. And the Library of Alexandria was destroyed, so that means that this was the largest library in Africa at the time. And what's interesting is that they were teaching not only Islamic sciences, but they were teaching mathematics, they were teaching philosophy, they were teaching science, they were teaching medicine, they were teaching all of the different things that make, you know, any modern curriculum, law, and all of these different things. And Google has recently, and it's interesting, Google has a project to preserve these manuscripts, and it's called the Timbuktu something project. I think if you just go to Google and you type in Timbuktu manuscripts, Google itself has created a whole page where they have a database and you can go through the different books that they've been scanning and digitizing because of you know the environment and also the political situation in Mali with the um, Islamic extremists burning books and taking over cities and doing certain things. There's been a push by Western academ academics and different organizations to try and preserve and digitize these manuscripts because it's a legacy of human you know knowledge and it's a legacy of 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 history, not just black history, not just West African history, but human history that a lot of people didn't know about because many people know about the universities of Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, Yale that have existed for the past couple of hundred years. Even going further back, the House of Wisdom in Baghdad and Karawin University in uh, Morocco and the Zaytuna University in Tunis and Al-Azhar in Egypt. But many people didn't know about this West African university, which was the Sankore University, which was on the same level, if not a higher level, than all of these other universities and teaching the same kind of things. But because of the neglect that was shown to West African culture and civilization, unfortunately, the legacy of that was lost. But alhamdulillah, people know about it now and they're trying to preserve it. You said uh, in, in your book that they even had detailed medical textbooks explaining how to conduct eye cataract removal operations, yes. thousands of verses of poetry translated and commented on not just in Arabic, but in local West African languages using the tradition of a Jami script. Like you said, science, mathematics, philosophy, astronomy, uh, 700,000 manuscripts, 25,000 students. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I, yeah, like you're saying, I never knew about this stuff. Yeah, nobody knows about this stuff. <laughs> SubhanAllah. Tell me about the most short-lived empire in African history and the heartfelt story of Samari Tor. This is the Ansari Podcast.